Hi there and uh, welcome back. Um, so in the previous videos, uh, we started introducing uh, the basic ideas behind uh, a secular term and, uh, and as a motivation to uh, studying the multi-scale expansion method. And um, uh, in order to in order to uh, see what a secular term is in the context of, uh, in particular in the context of nonlinear uh, ordinary differential equations, we started talking about the Duffing equation, uh, which is essentially a second order um, nonlinear differential equation. Uh, and here we've expressed it in terms, uh, again, we'll, we'll assume that everything has been suitably non-dimensionalized. So here y is, uh, we've taken y to be our dependent variable, which depends upon the variable t, which we'll take, which we'll interpret as the time variable. And therefore, this is an initial value problem. Um, so we have an equation of the form t2 y dt2 plus y plus x naught y q is 0, subject to the initial conditions that y at t the 0 is 1, and the, the first derivative of y, which we'll uh, use the shorthand notation y dot sometimes, uh, y dot is dy dt. So the first derivative of y at t equal to 0 is 0. And here epsilon is a small positive uh, parameter, which is much less than 1 and greater than 0. Um, and we saw that if we try and solve this equation using methods of regular perturbation uh, theory, uh, then there is a resonant interaction between, let's say, the zeroth order perturbation term y naught and uh, the first order perturbation term y1. So in, in other words, y0 keeps feeding energy to the y1 term. And as a result, the solution y uh, grows unboundedly with time. So, uh, so there was a secular term that arises in the, in, in the solution of, uh, uh, in, in the regular perturbation expansion of the solution. And that secular term suggests that y will grow with time. Uh, as time progresses, y will grow, uh, uh, keep growing with time. Uh, or in other words, that the system somehow keeps absorbing energy from uh, because of the resonant interaction between uh, consecutive orders that appear in the perturbation uh, series. Now, uh, in this video, let's see that, in fact, the solution to the Duffing equation should remain bounded for all times t. And therefore, the uh, our, 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 our regular perturbation method, which seems to suggest that y will grow unboundedly with time t, is in fact not correct. Um, and once we see that the solution to this equation should actually remain bounded, uh, and our regular perturbation method fails to capture it, at least to the order in which we expanded the regular perturbation series, which is we just retain uh, the, the first couple of terms in the expansion. So up to at least if, if, if we only truncate the series to that order, then our solution uh, for large time states is in fact not correct. Um, and, and this is the idea behind this video. Um, now, once and, and once we see that in fact the solution should remain bounded, that provides a good motivation to try and solving this equation using a different method, and which is which is where the multi-scale expansion method is uh, will come in, and we start talking about that. Um, so, 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 so in order to see that the solution to this equation actually remains bounded for all times t, uh, we use a trick that's quite often used. Uh, in, 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 in showing that certain equations, the solution to certain equations are bounded. Uh, and, and so it's a very useful, quite general uh, kind of a trick. And, and in this case, uh, the idea is that we take this equation and multiply both sides of this equation with y dot, which is the first derivative of y with respect to time t. So, uh, and let's just use the dot notation for the derivatives. Um, so we have this term uh, y double dot. So let me just write down the equation again, plus y plus x1 y q is zero and now multiply both sides with y dot so y dot times y dot so this side is zero uh, whereas on the left hand side we have y dot y double dot plus y y dot plus epsilon y q y dot is zero um, now if you look at these terms uh, we can actually write uh, all these terms as 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 the derivative of another um, uh, or rather, in fact, this entire expression, you can write it as the derivative of another expression. And that expression is uh, the first derivative of, um, now if you notice this term, this is of the form y dot times y double dot. So if we introduce a term of the form y dot square, uh, and now if you differentiate this once with respect to time, uh, let's do that here. So let's say you were to differentiate y dot square once with respect to time we find that we have two y dot, y double dot, right? So here we have a term which is of the form y dot, y double dot. So there is no factor of two, but the functional form y dot, y double dot is what we are after. So if we, if, we, if, we, if we introduce a term half y dot square, then we see that the derivative of half y dot square is in fact y dot, y double dot. In the same way, uh, y, y dot can be obtained as the derivative of half y square. And, and continuing this, 
uh, the term y cube y dot can be obtained as the derivative of uh, y to the power of 4. Right? Because if you differentiate this once with respect to time, you'll have 4 y, uh, 4 y cube times y dot, which is essentially, uh, and with a factor of 1 fourth, we have essentially reproduced this term. And this particular uh, uh, sort of expression, now this particular, uh, so, so what we see is that we have the complete time derivative of this particular expression. In other words, this expression should be some constant with respect to time. So y dot square half plus half y square plus epsilon by 4 y4 should be some constant. And that constant should be independent of time. <coughs> uh, and in fact, this expression, uh, this on the left hand side, is um, sometimes called the energy integral. So, so sometimes called the energy integral. Or rather, the energy of the, uh, the system that you're talking about. Um, and the reason uh, this uh, uh, the, the reason why it's called the energy uh, term is because uh, if, if, if you look at this if, if you think of this as a dynamical system so for instance this could be uh, a term that comes from let's say Newton's uh, equation where you have a term from m d to y dt2 uh, which is mass time acceleration and then this could be some kind of a forcing on the system so if this were a dynamical system where let's say y is the amplitude of oscillations of a simple harmonic oscillator or a pendulum um, then this expression uh, is actually the energy of that system because this is, for instance, the kinetic energy, and this is the and the, these two comes from the potential energy part of the system. And so this uh, entire expression is actually, uh, if, if you think of it as coming from a dynamical system, then this is uh, the energy of the uh, dynamical system you're considering. And what this tells us that the energy of the system is actually a constant; it doesn't change with time. Um, now, what is this constant? Um, now, in order to evaluate the constant, we can make use of our initial conditions um, because we know that y dot uh, at t equal to 0 is 0 and y at t equal to 0 is 1. But this constant is independent of time t. So, if we evaluate this constant at time t equal to 0, we know the constant for all times t. Now, at t equal to 0, this particular expression, uh, in fact, we can also write this expression as E t energy integral, which it, in, in this particular case, it doesn't depend upon time. Um, so, uh, so if you evaluate this uh, at t equal to 0, then the first term at t equal to 0 is 0. The second term is half times y square, but y is 1, so it's half plus epsilon by 4 y 4, y to the power of 4, which is again 1. So that is our constant. Uh, so we can write this as half plus epsilon by 4. Okay. Um, now, if you look at all these terms, uh, so so now let's consider the case when epsilon is positive, which is what our initial uh, assumption was that epsilon is positive. Now let's look at all these terms individually. We have half of y dot squared, so this is something squared, and therefore it will be positive for all times t. Then we have half of y squared, which is again a squared, and therefore positive for all times t. And then we have epsilon, which we take to be positive, um, y to the power of 4, which is again positive for all times t. And on the right hand side is half plus epsilon by 4, which is again positive for all times t. Therefore, let's pick up this term. What this tells us then is that half y squared should be less than half plus epsilon 4. That's because we have the sum of, we have three terms this, which are all positive, and the sum of all these three terms is actually this, this constant. Therefore, all these terms should be less than this constant. So half y squared is less than half of epsilon by 4. Or in other words, if you cancel the factor of 2 and take the square root, we will find that mod of y, and let's write that the function of t, is actually less than 1 plus epsilon by 2. Right? So, this tells us that y, in fact, should always be less than the square root of 1 plus epsilon by 2. Now, epsilon is some small positive number. Um, and therefore, what this tells us is that, is that modulus of yt is always bounded for all times t. So, yt is bounded for all times for all time t. And this is where we see that uh, the regular perturbation method, the solution that we obtain from the regular perturbation method, at least of second order that we have derived, is not consistent with this observation. Uh, that the solution yd should remain bounded for all times t. Um, now, 
uh, in fact, another way to think about this energy integral is that um, sometimes this is again a concept that's quite often used is that you can make a plot, uh, like if you, if, if you take the two dimensional plane and let's say label the x axis as y dot or plot the y dot values on the x axis and y along the y axis, um, then the fact that uh, the energy integral is actually a constant. Um, um, if, if you actually plot the, 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 the equation y dot versus y, we find that the, the fact that the energy integral is constant uh, results in us obtaining closed curves in this in this y dot y plane, and this is sometimes called a phase plane. Um, so, for instance, if you plot this for some particular choice epsilon, you might see a curve like this. For an, another choice epsilon, you might see a curve which is something like this. Um, sorry, something like this. Uh, so this could be, for instance, at epsilon equals zero. Then you change epsilon to uh, half maybe, and so on and so forth. So you find some closed curves, and and, and this 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 indicates to us that in fact the value of y is in fact bounded uh, as long as epsilon is a small parameter less than uh, as long as epsilon is not itself infinity, which we which 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 is, which is obviously not the case because we are considering epsilon to be a small parameter. So for instance, if epsilon were zero, then you find that mod y is less than one. Uh, if epsilon is at the most one, uh, even then you find that mod of yt is less than square root of 1.5. Um, so we find that uh, maybe the upper bound to the values of y can be, maybe this is one and the upper bound should be something like 1.2 and so on and so forth. Um, but you can actually plot this on a computer and see that you actually end up getting these closed curves. Um, so, so the fact that the solution y is bounded can also be uh, thought of or, or rather comes about from the fact that the energy energy expression that we've obtained by multiplying both sides of this equation y dot is actually evaluates to a constant for all times t. Um, and so, uh, so, so so with this I think uh, we, we can sort of believe or convince ourselves that uh, a simple regular perturbation expansion at least up to finite num finite order terms is probably not a correct way to go about solving this equation. And and this is what uh, and this is what leads us into talking about a new method, which is a multi-scale expansion method, uh, which actually is uh, not just applicable to this equation. It's actually a far more general method, which sort of encompasses even the WKB method, the boundary layer method that we've talked about before. So we we'll take a couple of examples and talk about this particular method in, in the coming videos. And uh, yeah, so hopefully this was some use, and see you soon. Thanks.